Dr. Carter Denny and Dr. Carlo Tornatore are going to be talking about COVID and the neurology issues. We're going to start off with Dr. Denny, who's going to talk about ischemic stroke in COVID. And then uh, Dr. Tornatore will talk about the uh, potential for long-term neurologic effects of COVID. You may not know uh, Dr. Denny. She's our first speaker. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. She went to medical school at Tulane, joined us for her residency here at Georgetown, then did a fellowship in Houston, and then came back to be on the faculty here in Carlos' department. And her specialty is quickly guest is neurovascular neurology. And our second speaker um, really needs no introduction, but I had to say something about him, and that's Carl Tornatari. <laughs> He's a professor and chair of the Department of Neurology and the executive director of the MS Patient Center Practice at Georgetown, and he also has a great title, I think, Neurologist-in-Chief, and so uh, that's great, Carlo. <laughs> Dr. Tornatori really is blue and gray throughout. He went to medical school here, did his residency here, he went to the NIH for his fellowship and then came back to lead the Department of Neurology. And he's an expert, as you'll hear today, about uh, uh, MS. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Denny to uh, start off our talk today. Dr. Denny. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Lexon, for a really kind introduction. Um, well, let's get started. So the title of our talk today is uh, Acute and Potential Long-Term Neurologic Manifestations of COVID-19. Um, and I will start the presentation and then I'm about halfway through, Dr. Tornatori will take over. And we just wanted to recognize up front that um, especially my presentation is really on behalf of the team that cared for the patient that I'll discuss. Um, that includes uh, neurology residents, Dr. Castillo Pinto and Dr. Lamote, uh, who's recently graduated, Dr. Di Maria, Dr. Meta. Uh, medicine residents, including uh, Dr. Ruiz and the, um, also uh, the critical care team and uh, ID teams with Dr. Santi, Dr. Kumar, um, and then our uh, stroke program director, Dr. Stemmer as well. So um, uh, I have no financial disclosures relevant to this presentation. Um, I do get grant support from Nidler um, and MHRI um, and get royalties from Cambridge University Press and um, have done a speaking engagement for Abbott Structural Heart. Um, so the objectives today are to understand the neurovirology and neuroimmunology of SARS-CoV-2, to understand the acute neurologic manifestations of COVID-19, and the potential long-term neurologic manifestations of COVID-19. Um, this is the outline of my talk. It's a bit busy, but basically we're gonna go through um, a case presentation um, and emerging literature regarding COVID-19 infection and stroke, um, potential pathophysiology, and then the discuss the differences between associations and causality with um, COVID-19 and stroke. Um, and certainly understanding that there's further data required to fully understand SARS-CoV-2's impact on the nervous system. Um, so the case presentation today um, is a, of a healthcare worker um, with a large vessel acute ischemic stroke likely related to mild SARS-CoV-2 infection. So in April of this year, um, there's a 43-year-old female who presented to um, a hospital in our network, MedStar Montgomery, with right-sided weakness, aphasia, and dysarthria. She was last known well two hours prior to presentation. And her only past medical history was prediabetes. Um, social history that's pertinent is that she's a nurse at a local nursing home. Um, and multiple nursing home residents were suspected or confirmed COVID positive. Um, and on review of systems, she had a cough for one week um, without fever, without dyspnea, without any significant fatigue. She had sought medical attention at a local clinic and gotten antibiotics, and she was, but she was not tested for um, SARS-CoV-2. So her vitals on arrival to the um, other hospital, which was MedStar Montgomery, um, were only notable really for an elevated heart rate of 112. Uh, the rest of her vitals were fairly uh, normal. Um, on arrival for her neurologic exam, she had an NIH stroke scale of five. Um, that's a, a mild stroke range, zero to five is mild. And then on telestroke, um, the stroke faculty members cover um, uh, telestroke services um, for the entire MedStar network. And that was a little bit higher. It was actually kind of the mild stroke range, um, notable for expressive aphasia um, and 
but still able to give most of her own medical history, um, right facial droop, um, and then right-sided weakness involving her arm more than her leg, um, and intact sensation. So pertinent labs um, were that this patient had a SARS-CoV-2 um, PCR swab done at MedStart Montgomery, and that result was available to us prior to her transfer um, for acute evaluation and treatment. Um, her CBC was relatively unremarkable. Um, PTINR was fine. Her uh, BMP was within normal limits. And we just added here some of her um, later SARS-CoV-2 labs um, that the group is now probably familiar with. Um, she did have an elevated BSR, CRP, and D-dimer. So pertinent imaging done at Metzer Montgomery was this chest X-ray, which I will now, now look familiar to you as well. She had bilateral central and mid-loading zone consolidations and kind of fluffy infiltrates that looked like viral pneumonia. So um, on her imaging, um, it's our standard of care for acute stroke to do a series of imaging that includes non-contrast head CT, um, CT angiogram, and CT perfusion. And this is standardized throughout the MedStar network. Um, and so these images are available to the on-call stroke neurologist um, who's available by video. We've had this in place for several years and our, the technology has you know, just uh, gotten better over time, which is great. So the, um, what you're seeing on the screen is this a pink area on the perfusion screen, um, which is basically the core infarct, or that represents the brain that we think is already dead, and then a larger green area um, which shows the um, penumbra or area at risk for stroke that's not yet permanently injured. Um, so in light of these findings and also the big arrow sign showing a clot in the left MCA um, causing this big perfusion deficit and ongoing stroke, the patient was transferred to, from MedStar Montgomery to um, Georgetown and underwent a thrombectomy. Um, I think it's notable in this case that it was our first patient that was transferred with known SARS-CoV-2, um, and you know there was a we, uh, we had a you know thankfully the result before she came and everybody was ready with their masks and the you know, filters and everything, but it was definitely scary I think for the team taking care of her, wanting to make sure that we maintain the standard of care um, for an acute stroke patient, but also protecting the team. So. Initially, um, TPA had been initiated at MedStar Montgomery, but looking at the um, scans, Dr. Stemmer, who was on call that night, felt like the, there was a large core infarct that was um, made it her higher risk for bleeding, so the TPA was stopped. Um, he also had the pleasure of being not only on telestrip call, but neurointerventional call, and was the one to come in and to do her thrombectomy that night. Um, and thankfully, in a single pass, it was a pretty easy procedure. Um, the left MCA was recanalized completely. Of note, there was um, thrombus um, in the eight French short sheath when during the uh, closure device placement, um, which made us suspect a hypercoagulable state. Also, quite a large clot, a three centimeter clot, was removed from the left MCA. She was admitted to the COVID ICU at that time with C62. Um, and actually was doing quite well from a respiratory standpoint. Um, the stroke etiology evaluation and secondary prevention. So for her inpatient stroke workup, she um, had was on telemetry in normal sinus rhythm with no AFib, um, had, a, had labs done as well, um, which were all negative in terms of the traditional uh, arterial hypercoags. She had a TEE, which was normal and showed no PFO. The only notable labs really were just an elevated A1C in the diabetes range as to previous was just pre-diabetic. Pre um, so for secondary prevention of stroke, we initiated a heparin drip um, after 24 hours and after the repeat CT scan did not show any hemorrhage into the infarct and then subsequently transitioned to Lovenox um, for presumed COVID-related hypercoagulable state, um, which was continued um, for almost three months. Um, so early outcomes, um, she's doing great. Um, she's made a miraculous um, recovery and is really doing awesome. She's living at home with her 19-year-old son, who was the one who found her confused at home. Um, he called 911 and then convinced her, along with MedStar County EMS providers, to go to the hospital. Um, and she was confused at the time from her aphasia, um, so she was a little resistant at first. So it was really the heroes here in this case were really her 
son uh, and EMS. Um, she can, uh, completed some PT and OT sessions, but discontinued them due to the a lapse in her insurance coverage at the time. Um, she still has some very mild hand weakness and right facial droop, but they're um, you know, resolving it better every week. She's, um, her, her aphasia is completely resolved. She speaks fluently in her native Swahili and also English. Um, and she returned to work at a different nursing home um, that has mat adequate masks and gloves and PPE um, around June 1st. So um, really an incredible, you know, incredible case for a lot of reasons. Everything worked really well in the system of care um, for this patient. I think that really made all the difference. Um, I just wanted to transition to a little bit of background, be familiar to this group, but just some highlights about SARS-CoV-2, um, which is the novel coronavirus responsible for COVID-19. It became the leading cause of death in the United States in April 2020. It has an R naught of three, meaning it's highly infectious, as demonstrated by the, uh, the um, graphic here. On average, one person will infect three. Um, and at the, at the peak of the uh, pandemic situation in New York City, the R0 was actually six. Um, so uh, also uh, currently about one third and even somewhere between 20 and 40% of infected individuals are likely asymptomatic, um, but can potentially transmit the virus. So um, in terms of the clinical presentation and neurological complications, everybody at this group knows what the, you know, what the symptoms of, um, of COVID-19 can look like. What's interesting is that there's such a large spectru spectrum of illness. Um, some people have no symptoms at all. Sometimes they'll have very mild symptoms, maybe cough, fatigue, sore throat, diarrhea. Um, and then about, uh, you know, of the, uh, about 5% of people require ICU care, about 15% of people require um, admission to the hospital. Um, case fatality rate has varied somewhere between one to three percent, um, but the most severe cases most often are seen in patients with comorbidities, although that's not universally true. Um, in terms of neurological complications, um, uh, about a third of patients in a paper that came out of China had some neurological complication. That could be anything from anosmia to stroke, um, suspected meningo encephalitis, um, the more nonspecific symptoms such as headache uh, and then depressed level of consciousness uh, and dizziness. Um, similar to SARS-CoV, uh, um, which is kind of the predecessor, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 um, utilizes the ACE2 receptor to gain entry into cells. Um, as this group may or may not know and was uh, something that we were really researching and thinking about at the time, is that glia neurons and endothelial cells express ACE2, making them, um, you know, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, making them a potential target. Um, so there's a hypothesis of medullary involvement, um, at least partially contributing to respiratory impairment as well. Uh, it might be, you know, a sort of central nervous system um, that could be involved in some of the respiratory compromise, which seems to be quite variable. Um, uh, across patients. So um, you may have read in the, um, in the news or just read about it um, in the literature. In about April, we started um, to hear more and more cases of young and middle-aged people who were, um, who were suffering strokes that were thought to be related to COVID-19. Um, based on the published, published literature so far, the prevalence of stroke in patients with COVID-19 is about two to 5%. Um, and with, um, you know, more than 100,000 people infected, um, sorry, more than 100,000 deaths right now and millions of infections um, in this country, you know, I think it's um, two, two to five percent is actually not a small number. Um, so there have been multiple reports um, about um, the drop in the number of patients who were seeking acute stroke care um, during the pandemic as people were afraid to come to the hospital. Um, and it's possible that some people with minor strokes are just not coming um, because of fear. Um, and, you know, the, it's hard to know, you know, how, you know, what the mechanism is here, but it does um, really seem 
like there's a, a strong correlation, at least, or association between um, COVID-19 and stroke. So kind of stepping back a little bit to where this information has come from, um, the data, early data from China, early meaning earlier in 2020, um, you know, there was a report of stroke occurred in six patients of 214 um, and was more common in patients with severe disease. Um, and that was six out of 214 patients. Um, and ischemic stroke was the most common uh, stroke subtype as opposed to intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and moving on to kind of the, pen, you know, the pandemic sort of then was moving to, um, to Europe, there was also a report of 58 patients with severe infection admitted to two intensive care units that were designated as um, COVID units, and 5% of those had ischemic strokes as confirmed by MRI. Um, in France, it's a standard of care for all acute stroke patients to have MRI as their screening tool. Um, so the MRI is probably more widely used in the hyperacute setting um, than the US or other countries. Um, so um, I think moving on from there, also in the Italian experience, about two and a half percent of uh, patients in Northern Italy at a hospital designated for COVID patients um, also experienced ischemic stroke. Um, and again, seemed to be higher in patients with severe disease admitted to the ICU. Um, so moving on to data from the US, and you may have heard this in the lay press or seen it, there were five cases of large vessel stroke in patients younger than 50 years of age in New York City um, that were reported in the New England Journal. And this had represented an increase in terms of uh, large vessel strokes in young people since the previous 12 months. Um, there were uh, four of those patients were very similar to our patient. They had a proximal large vessel occlusion in the MCA, and there was one with a questionable ICA dissection. Um, this is probably too small for people to read, but I'll just reference if you Google um, you know, or search New England Journal of Medicine uh, stroke um, and COVID, this is what will come up. And this group out of New York um, is centered at Mount Sinai, and they plan to publish a, a series now of a larger number of patients. But what's notable here is the patients that they present are in their 30s and 40s. Um, they um, are mostly on no medication. Um, some have some undiagnosed vascular risk factors, but some have no medical history. Um, and the um, symptoms that they have are pretty widely varied again. Some had no symptoms, some people had just lethargy, some had fever and cough, which are more typical. Um, and some, even one of the people had no symptoms, but had a recent uh, family member who was PCR uh, positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the severity of the strokes by um, NIH stroke scale were um, pretty high. Um, we're in the teens, which is kind of a moderate to severe stroke range. So um, we know that viral and bacterial infections are associated with increased risk of stroke. That's not new. Um, we know we've known that at least since the 90s, probably earlier than that. Um, and the pathophysiology is not completely understood. We think it has something to do with infections being a pro-inflammatory uh, state. There might be endothelial disruption and probably multiple mechanisms are involved. Um, the schematic here is from a paper about uh, 12, 13 years ago, um, which is showing the kind of the activation of the nervous system, sorry, the, the activation of the uh, immune system in response to stroke. Um, so um, there also seems to be no difference um, in you know, one paper from the early 90s from Grau's group in the hypercoagulable markers between um, post-infectious stroke and controls. Like there, a lot of inflammatory markers are high amongst people who have strokes due to atrial fibrillation or strokes due to just hypertension. Um, and you know, the, so the common infections that we're used to looking for, uh, for potentially related to stroke are syphilis, TB, varicella. Varicella is a really big one. Um, HSV, you know, herpes and HIV. Um, so, we know that COVID-19 is associated with a coagulopathy, and that could certainly be part of the, um, or a hypercoagulable state, I should say, and that could be part of the reason that stroke is involved here. And we've seen, you know, infarcts in people's spleens and their kidneys, you know, sort of widespread throughout the body. Um, and 
Um, this has been kind of documented in a couple of papers now in the Lancet and in um, the New England Journal. Um, the New England Journal by Zhang and colleagues also noted that antiphospholipid antibodies were found in patients with COVID-19, um, even not in the setting of stroke. Um, and these were also found in patients with critical illness um, and various infections. So there's something there. You know, there's a big question, which Dr. Tornatore will get more into, is um, can the virus uh, infect the brain? And there's a few case reports that it could um, cause meningoencephalitis. Um, however, uh, and SARS-CoV-2 was found in the CSF of um, one patient in one report. Um, but it's speculative, and I think we really don't know enough about this yet. Um, there have been no cases to date of vasculitis or arteritis in the brain um, that we know of at, at, at this point. Um, so what about arrhythmia? Um, could, maybe there's an intermediary here, maybe COVID is causing an arrhythmia, um, and that is what leads to um, embolic appearing strokes. Um, you know, the, we know that from a paper, um, there were recent cardiac injury and 16% um, developed arrhythmia. Um, so that's a possible mechanism. Um, and, you know, we can't rule out the possibility of a transient arrhythmia in a predisposed individual. Um, but of the patients that have been reported to date um, in major journals, there hasn't been documentation of stroke patients necessarily being higher risk for arrhythmia than, um, than would have otherwise be expected. So um, I think the take home messages here from my portion of the presentation are that um, patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection um, may be at higher risk for stroke um, and stroke usually occurs in severe cases but can happen in mild cases, patients who have very few symptoms. Um, the mechanism of action of large vessel occlusion seems to be, is not entirely clear yet. Um, we think there's a hypercoagulable state that is involved. There may be other mechanisms that aren't completely understood. And we really need to um, uh, do more studies to explore the relationship between stroke uh, and SARS-CoV-2. Um, we also don't know what the optimal management is. Um, you know, we've been... Um, thinking about this and reading about this and um, looking into a lot of the neuropathology, which is really important to try to understand, you know, is it the right thing to put somebody on Lovenox and for how long? Um, we really need outcome-based um, data to, to help guide our decisions in the future. I think this really highlights um, the importance of stroke systems of care. Um, our system of care really worked for this patient. Um, from uh, you know, family recognizing symptoms at home, being brave enough to call 911, EMS, um, making, you know, figuring out this looked like a stroke, bringing them to the nearest stroke ready hospital, and then the telestroke network that supports the entire MedStar health system and um, hospitals beyond uh, soon to come um, to provide stroke expertise um, in the middle of the night to a patient at a community hospital. Um, and um, getting the patient here quickly by helicopter with the MedStar transport team um, and her, you know, very fast thrombectomy really, I think, made all the difference. It also highlights the importance that um, we keep telling our patients and really make it a public service um, outcry that we have to have our patients still come into the hospital and call 911 if the if stroke is suspected. Um, I just want to uh, also just thank the whole team who cared uh, for this patient. She's incredibly grateful to the whole team. Um, and I couldn't find every single person's uh, picture, but I wanted to highlight the EMTs again, Marina Gomez and Jaime Calderon from uh, Montgomery County EMS, um, our MedStar transport team, uh, Edwin, Emmett, and Doug, um, who brought her here. Um, you know, these are familiar faces as a total dream team uh, who took care of her. Um, Dr. Lehman was here um, when she arrived in the ED, um, Dr. Lamo, Dr. Mecha, um, Dr. Castillo Pinto, um, it, did her admission, and Dr. Di Maria from Neurology. Um, Dr. Kumar is incredibly helpful in this case, um, really helped with a lot of the putting the pieces together. Um, and Dr. O'Brien and Dr. Caffey admitted her to the ICU. Um, really, really grateful to this whole team, especially um, toward the end of first day to Dan Ruiz and um, uh, uh, Dr. Feldman, um, who helped you know, her transition of care um, out of the hospital. So teamwork really is dreamwork here. Um, I'm very grateful to this multidisciplinary team.
And to that, I will uh, let Carlo take over, um, and I'm happy to advance the slides. Fantastic, fantastic. Dr. Tornatore, can we have you come off mute? Okay, I think I just got unmuted. Can you all hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, Carter, that was fantastic. Uh, really a tour de force of the uh, vascular complications of SARS-CoV-2, which is probably um, uh, you know, the most recognized uh, acute issue with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, I had the fortune uh, in the early 90s when I was a postdoc at the NIH to um, work with Tony Fauci I worked on HIV, I worked on JC virus, and you know, in addition to working on MS, at that time we thought it really was viral related. We still sort of think it is, but as such, um, we did a lot of work crossing over neuroimmunology and neurovirology. And the coronaviruses were always um, something we were interested in because we recognized that uh, they definitely had neuroinvasive property. And uh, when SARS uh, came, we quickly recognized that the SARS virus um, definitely had neuroinvasive properties. Um, and SARS-CoV-2, uh, being a very close uh, relative to this original SARS virus, we figure it may have the same type of properties. And I'm going to go through that. Um, and I think one of the, the old uh, axes is that what's old is new, uh, which is very true. Um, and as you're going to see, uh, I think that we, there's a lot to be learned from the 1918 pandemic. So just a little background. Uh, Carter touched upon this. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail, uh, but the virology, we're talking about SARS-CoV-2. This is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Um, it's a successor to SARS-CoV-1, um, and we think it arose in pangolins, uh, which you can see in the bottom right. Looks a little bit like an armadillo, apparently a delicacy uh, in China. Uh, is found not infrequently in wet markets. And there is a thought that perhaps uh, there was a bat intermediate. So coronaviruses are traditionally, their reservoir are bats, uh, that there was perhaps a bat intermediary that um, uh, bit a pangolin and then the coronavirus uh, got transmitted to a bat and then the bat subsequently jumped to humans. Uh, very, very unclear, uh, you know, how that happened. But uh, there was a sequence from a pangolin which is almost 100% similar to the uh, original SARS-CoV isolate that came out of Wuhan. So it does seem to be that. Um, as Carter said, the um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is the receptor. And this is now the seventh known coronavirus known to infect humans. Now, this is important. Um, as you'll see in the subsequent slide, when we just take a look at the immunology of, uh, of this. To the far right, is the structure of uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is uh, an eight, this is an RNA virus. Um, it has a spike protein envelope membrane and nucleo, nucleocapsid proteins. The spike protein um, is by far the most common protein on the outside of the virus and is a terrific um, uh, target for, uh, for uh, a vaccine. Um, and in a paper in Cell last month, which I would encourage all of you to read, it's probably the best paper I've seen on the immunology of somebody who's had COVID. Um, what they found is that, uh, and this is out of the um, scripts uh, in, uh, in Southern California. Uh, so they looked at 10 patients who had recovered from COVID-19, and all of them had helper T cells and IgG that recognized the spike protein, as well as other viral elements. Uh, and 70% of the patients also had virus-specific killer T cells as well. Mm -hmm. So clearly there is a very robust response to the virus, uh, particularly the spike protein. And just about every vaccine that's being developed has targeted the spike protein as its target antigen. So that tells me that um, it is obviously the correct antigen for a vaccine, but moreover, it really looks like it will be very immunogenic and lead to a very... Um, uh, efficacious vaccine. What's also interesting, though, is the folks at Scripps, they took uh, samples from patients from 2015 to 2018, pre-COVID, pre 
and 34% of them already had helper T cells that recognize SARS-CoV-2. Now that's incredibly interesting, and it suggests that there is some cross-reactivity uh, to um, other coronaviruses. For instance, there are coronaviruses, there's seven, this is the seventh one, but previous ones, um, if you look beyond SARS and MERS, um, can cause uh, you know, cold-like symptoms. And it's a question of whether there isn't uh, already a population of folks who may already have some immunity uh, to um, SARS-CoV-2 based on previous exposure to um, uh, other type of coronaviruses. So that's a, a really, really interesting observation that a third of people already had immunity against SARS in the pre-COVID area. Um, and then there's a preprint uh, April 22nd also showed that post-COVID uh, patients had not only uh, IgG, but also uh, helper T cells. Um, it's not as in-depth as the cell paper, but uh, again, it really complements uh, the two. If we go to the next slide. Now, this virus mutates, and this is highly, highly relevant um, to uh, its neuroinvasive properties potentially, but also um, to how we're going to manage this long term. And so uh, there is a database of uh, genomes of, of SARS-CoV-2. And to date, there are already 4,690 mutations uh, of the virus um, across six continents. If we go to the next slide, and this is a, a really um, very depressing view, if you will. To the far left, you can see uh, the origin of SARS-CoV-2 in December 2019. And that was the virus that was uh, um, sequenced in Wuhan. And then you can see over time, uh, as you go from left to right, the different colors represent different continents that the virus had gone to and then um, mutated and uh, subsequently sequenced. And over time, the virus has continued to mutate um, to the point where now there are you know, different clads in different continents. There are different strains that seem to populate different continents. And obviously, as people start to move around again, uh, these will start to intermingle. Um, and so clearly, there is mutations that are happening with this virus. And that's not a surprise, because the original SARS virus in 2004 is the origin of SARS-CoV-2. And that SARS virus um, mutated enough, there was a, approximately a 70% mutation, uh, mutated enough that, uh, that we basically, um, humanity has almost no immunity to it, with maybe the exception of that one third of folks who maybe have some cross immunity to it. So this virus mutates very quickly. And the question is gonna be, will, it, will there be mutations at the uh, spike protein um, that may lead to um, loss of efficacy of a vaccine that's targeting that, that particular epitope or antigen. So, uh, and this again is not unlike what happens with influenza where there are different strains every year. So this is kind of a, a money slide for understanding um, where we're gonna be longer term with SARS-CoV-2. If we go to the next slide, um, so this brings us to the, um, the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. So what you can appreciate, there were, these are the deaths during that period. And there were three waves, I think, as most of you recognize, of influenza uh, from 1918 through 1919. And uh, this is, uh, goes back to some of the original uh, papers. The original wave, um, which was in June and July, was kind of a, a minor blip throughout the world, not minor, but you know, um, not as significant as the second wave, which happened about four months later. And that was a huge wave. Uh, and then there was a third wave after that. And there was, there's been a lot of speculation as to why there were three waves. The initial wave clearly was um, the original influenza uh, virus. And there was some thought that there was definitely mutation uh, over, over that period of time, or there were folks who were uh, very mildly affected that continued uh, to um, roam around. And those that were the most severely affected, and this is during World War I, uh, ended up in camps uh, where they quickly spread the virus to other folks uh, because of the density of the of people. And then there was a second major wave because uh, there was just the density of folks. And so it's unclear 
whether uh, the current COVID-19 epidemic may follow the same pattern if we have, again, more mutation of the virus, might we see this second big wave? Or as we see social distancing um, um, behavior starts to break down, whether we might actually see this. And we may be seeing that right now in the numbers um, here in the US. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, and what's old is new. Uh, and so in 1918, there was social upheaval. Uh, and on the left, uh, you can see the, uh, the boys in blue. There were frequently um, uh, riots about lack of food. Um, there was um, a, lot of, a lot of social unrest and World War I was going on at the same time. And, um, and there was also an anti-mask lead of San Francisco in 1918. Uh, and they were formed in protest. There was a requirement that people in San Francisco had to wear a mask and they protested against it. Again, what's old is new and you can see this gentleman is not wearing a mask, uh, whereas the barber is. And so um, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, next slide. This was the recommendations as to how to treat influenza. Um, and there are some just some wonderful, wonderful things here. Um, uh, some instructions, which some of them are relevant today. Uh, some of them in particular, I think, are worth pointing out. Um, again, if you look at one, go to bed directly. Um, if you feel symptoms like pain in the head or limbs or a quote, cold, uh, go to bed in a room not occupied by a person who is well and stay there until the temperature returns to normal. Social distancing at its best, right? Uh, I love this. I'm going to bed. Take a drink of any kind as hot as possible, remove sheets and lie between the blankets. <laughs> so I guess this is the equivalent of a cooling, cooling blanket. Uh, and then I love uh, five, don't depress yourself by looking at the bad side. Um, and then uh, number six, remember the large majority of persons who take ill get well. I think this is where our, our current uh, president may have gotten his, some of his uh, verbiage. Um, only one member of the family should visit the patient's room. Uh, and then, um, this is great, number nine, if no doctor has prescribed it for you, take ammoniated quinine in a half to a teaspoon dose and plenty of water every four hours. So here again, hydroxychloroquine makes its, uh, rears its ugly head yet again. Um, and then they go on to um, uh, you know, recommend boric acid and a bunch of other things. Uh, and then uh, number 13, uh, don't go outdoors except into direct sunlight until the catarrh cold in the head, if you have the symptoms, is quite gone. Uh, and so, you know, there are, you know, obviously much to be learned uh, from them, and, but it makes us realize we haven't come a whole much further other than, you know, uh, really great care within the, within the uh, hospital setting. If we go to the next slide, these were the symptoms from, uh, that were reported from the Army during that pandemic. Uh, and this is interesting because they basically said, okay, at, at a camp, did, did you have the symptom, yay or nay? And that was a black box. And then across the top, they looked at 16 different camps. And what you can appreciate um, are a series of symptoms along the left-hand side, not all that different from what we're seeing now with the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, patients. And um, again, quite interesting, there was a sudden onset uh, of symptoms in these patients. And uh, you know, and I guess the lovely prostation was the second most common symptoms. Um, uh, but then there were a whole series of them that were um, not listed here. If you go to the next slide, what's interesting is that cytokine storm was actually reported during the 1918 influenza epidemic, which is a little striking to me because uh, the concept of cytokine storm, I don't think was uh, common parlance at that time, but was recognized as something that happened. And interestingly, it was recognized as something that happened in, in uh, younger folks that had it. Um, and so here, in the bottom right is, I think, a very, very interesting uh, um, uh, graph that shows in the dotted lines, uh, other uh, epidemics that had occurred, which tend to cause deaths in the very young and the very old. But the 1918 influenza epidemic, definitely you had deaths in the young and the old, but then there was this peak in people who were in their 20s and 30s, um, which was attributed to this, um, this really profound uh, 
uh, respiratory cytokine storm as they as they told it. And it, it, we do have to wonder whether the current um, wave of infections that we're seeing, which ostensibly seem to be happening in more younger people, is the beginning of this peak uh, in that we may be seeing in the uh, the COVID uh, era. And so again, it's kind of interesting that they saw this uh, peak and we may be starting to see this peak now. Uh, if you go to the next slide, but then there were, and this is the thing that kind of struck me, the not insig insignificant number of people during the influenza pandemic described loss of hearing and smell, impaired color vision, and there was many folks who had delirium. Now we can certainly account for the delirium uh, potentially is hypoxia or any other uh, systemic issues going on. But the loss of smell uh, and the impaired color vision clearly speak to something else that was going on that was um, either neuroinvasive. And the question was, was that influenza that was doing that? Um, and then a very unusual thing happened concurrent with the flu epidemic. And if we go to the next slide. Um, so von Economo, uh, in 1917 uh, and 16 thereabouts, said, you know, there is something concurrently going on during the influenza pandemic. And he described these patients who became acutely somnolent, uh, almost narcoleptic uh, in, uh, as we recognize it now, where they would fall suddenly asleep. Um, and then they would have these unbelievably wild eye gyrations, what are called ocular gyric crisis. Um, and then some of them would recover, and this was a pandemic. This happened throughout the world rather suddenly, and there were over five million people who suffered from this. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, so these patients, this was peak October of 1918 to January 1919. It was called encephalitis lethargica, and it was at exactly the same time as the influenza pandemic uh, during that second wave. And again, these patients had somnolence, ophthalmoplegia, anosmia, not necessarily any respiratory symptoms. But what was most interesting is that uh, those that recovered from this then developed Parkinson's within months to several years after, after this episode. And this ocular gyro crisis was a real hallmark of this post-encephalitic Parkinson's. So a lot of people struggled with, you know, what the heck was happening here? Was this caused by influenza? Or was there a second virus that was uh, concurrent with the influenza uh, epidemic um, and that just got spread because World War I was happening and there was um, just two things happening uh, simultaneously. If we go to the next slide, the interesting thing is this whole concept of anosmia or losing smell, a hallmark of COVID, also a hallmark of influenza, and just a, a little bit of anatomy here, just to show that, that you can, viral infection of the upper respiratory tract can gain access to the brainstem through that V1 of the trigeminal nerve. So you can see uh, the virus basically uh, nasal infection, and then it works its way backwards into the brainstem. And then um, there is uh, not insignificant amount of data to show that in animals, this is a real mechanism whereby a virus can gain access into the brainstem uh, right near the respiratory centers. And so you wonder some of the folks that had sudden respiratory decline in the absence of any bona fide res uh, uh, chest x-rays uh, changes, whether they may have had um, a brainstem uh, viral uh, meningoencephalitis. And then the substantia nigra is right there also. And so if you have a brainstem encephalitis, you may develop Parkinsonism as you start to have neuronal dropout very quickly thereafter. So if we go to the next slide, um, and we know that the coronaviridae are neuroinvasive. So the original SARS virus and MERS uh, were isolated and uh, they were injected into uh, mice and they were quickly shown to infect the brainstem when placed into the nares. Uh, and this is really very interesting. Um, people went back and looked at those post-encephalitic Parkinson's patients, uh, looked at the midbrain, and uh, one neuropathologist did electron microscopy and said he had identified coronavirus in those brain. That was about 30 years ago. Um, and so if we accept that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 is probably neuroinvasive, and there are definitely enough people who have 
uh, a meningoencephalitis or have headache to suggest that it really is. The question is, if it's gaining, gaining access via the brainstem, are we gonna see a wave of Parkinson's disease all over again over the next decade and possibly in a younger age group given the, um, the stochastic infection that we're seeing now? Uh, so this is, this is my working thesis, is that are we gonna see this wave of, of, uh, of Parkinson's-like uh, disorders over the next couple years? If we go to the next slide, and so this is um, a study being do done by Dr. Harris, who I know is on the call today. Um, and this is a postmortem study to determine whether this thesis is correct or not. Does SARS-CoV-2 infect the brainstem? And so the uh, idea is if someone passes from COVID-19, um, it would be terrific if we could get consent from the family for the brain to be donated uh, for this study. Dr. Harris is here at Georgetown. And then he's going to look uh, at all aspects of the nerve axis to see whether the virus has gained access to the nervous system uh, or if we see um, any inflammatory um, uh, response to that, to that virus. And I do have the phone number here um, and we can distribute it to everyone, um, but we would really encourage you, and I know it's a very, very difficult thing, you know, when someone passes in the hospital given that families frequently are not there and it's a hard, hard conversation but it's an extraordinarily important um, uh, study that's being done. And if we, if we can possibly get um, any tissue from patients um, that, that, uh, for this, it would be unbelievably uh, helpful uh, in helping us understand and possibly projecting into the future what, what we may see. Um, and so my part of the talk clearly is much more speculative um, than, uh, than Dr. Denny's part. But I do think that these are the kind of things that um, we really need to be um, uh, aware of. I think the encephalitis lethargica and post-encephalitis uh, Parkinsonism really are teaching us that uh, th these pandemics um, coming from zoonotic uh, sources are just going to be with us over and over again, and that uh, the nervous system is just really just a, um, a very vulnerable uh, end organ that's probably going to be affected by all of this. So that's my last slide, and uh, we're happy to take questions on either part. Thank you both so much for a, a really uh, terrific review. Um, a couple of questions have come in through the chat. Uh, number one, Dr. Kuru asks, did they actually call it cytokine storm in 1918, or did they use some other name? That's right. And so there, so uh, as you guys well know, cytokine storm is not a term of art during that period. Um, and, and so the, the literature I looked at referred to what was happening in 1918 as cytokine storm. And to be honest, I need to go back to the source documents to figure out if that's what they actually were calling it or if they were calling it uh, you know, some type of an inflammatory response because even our knowledge of the immune system in 1918 was not very sophisticated uh, at all. So um, I, I, I will, today I will get back to you on that once I, I get a little bit more clarity on that. Uh, let's see, and Dr. Harris said he, he would like to provide a caveat or a clarification on the, the donation. Yeah, hi, thank you, uh, Carlo um, and Carter for great presentation. Um, you know, the, the status right now for COVID autopsies in the MedStar system is that MedStar is not allowing us to do autopsies um, of known COVID patients. So I am worried, and, and, and folks that do pass away here uh, in the hospital, uh, the medical examiner is um, taking responsibility for those cases. So I am working up several cases um, of COVID uh, in the brain with the medical examiner's office. Um, I'm the neuropathologist for the DCME's office. Um, so we unfortunately cannot accept donations right now in our system, but what uh, I would hope to plant in everybody's uh, mind is that as we go on in the coming years, folks that have survived um, with COVID infection are going to be um, extremely interesting uh, to follow and to look at for their neurologic symptoms. And then um, if the family 
ultimately makes that um, gift decision for a donation to be able to look at their brains uh, later on. The Georgetown Brain Bank um, has been in existence for 10 years and we, um, there's no charge to families. So there are a lot of questions that families have around the process. Um, we often have funds to even transport the bodies from funeral homes and from their home. And so we try to minimize any kind of uh, expense um, to families and provide them with a full uh, diagnostic report. So I just wanted to make that uh, clarification right now. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to do autopsies at Georgetown um, of known COVID cases. Uh, but we are uh, working up those cases in a different way at the medical examiner's office. Uh, thank you. Uh, from uh, Dr. Belante, Dr. Tornatore, could the transmission of the virus through the cribriform plate and involvement of uncus uh, be related to the loss of smell? Yes, that's you know that's the um, the the working hypothesis. There was actually a, uh, a great image that was published about two months ago in the journal Neurology. It's an MRI of somebody who had COVID, and they had very tremendous uh, swelling, swollen uh, ophthalmic uh, uh, olfactory nerve uh, involvement. And that goes right back into the, yes, to the uncus, uh, but also back to the brainstem. Uh, and so those two things um, uh, clearly really lead to what we suspect is the pathogenesis. And it's not unique to coronaviruses. Many viruses find their way back uh, into the brainstem that way. Herpes viruses, influenza viruses, um, really even rabies virus. There's any number of them that use the same pathway. And I think the end result is um, kind of a final common pathway for a lot of different viruses that find themselves into the nervous system. Um, and we may never know exactly what caused that outbreak of Parkinson's disease, um, but clearly it's teaching us that it, it, it can be uh, mediated by something in the environment, probably something that was viral mediated, um, and therefore really teaches us, you know, what about idiopathic Parkinson's, what about a lot of the other neurodegenerative disorders? Um, and in truth, an outbreak of Parkinson's would teach us a tremendous amount were that to happen over the next couple of years. Uh, let's see, from Dr. Reichner, Dr. Tornatore, you had previously mentioned to myself and Dr. Lazarus, vitamin D's relationship with viral infections. Yes. What is your opinion of vitamin D and COVID? Oh, well, I'm glad I, I sent you, that. this is, this was funny. I was walking out to the parking garage and I saw uh, uh, Dr. Reichner and uh, Dr. Lazarus and they both had this glum look on their face. This was probably the beginning of April and the units were filling up with COVID patients. And I'm like, oh my God, I said, this is going to be uh, terrible. It's going to be Wuhan all over again. And I said, are you taking your vitamin D? And they both looked at me and they're like, what are you talking about? I said, oh, there was this article in the British Medical Journal about three years ago that showed that um, taking vitamin D um, significantly decreased the risk of viral respiratory infections. And so I dutifully sent it off to them since... These guys are at the front line. Um, and there is, it's an interesting paper. We don't quite understand why uh, vitamin D might protect against viral mediated respiratory infections. Um, uh, or, you know, um, we know in, in the uh, MS world that there's no question that vi there are vitamin D receptors on lymphocytes and that um, giving vitamin D supplementation clearly modulates the immune system and so I guess one of the questions is, you know, is it that the vitamin D, not that it's antiviral, but that perhaps modulates the immune response enough so that people don't get a very brisk um, immune response to it or that cytokine response to it? Um, not, not quite sure, but um, I, I, all my MS patients have been taking vitamin D. And what's quite interesting is um, all of our patients are taking pretty large doses of vitamin D in, in the, uh, throughout the U.S. and MS. And there are currently 3 million cases of COVID in the U.S. Well, one in 300 people in the U.S. has MS. That means there should be 100,000 people in the U.S. with multiple sclerosis who have COVID. Well, there's a, a large database that all of us are contributing to, and there is nowhere near that number at all. Um, which raises a very, very interesting 
a question as to whether, number one, is it because they're taking vitamin D? Number two, is it that their own autoimmunity may be protecting them against uh, SARS-CoV-2? Number three, could they have previous exposure to a SARS, a coronavirus that already conferred immunity, and maybe that's what caused their MS? And that's why they already have this um, resistance to it to some degree. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, speculation about why we're not seeing it as frequently in our MS population. Having said that, I have eight patients with MS that have developed COVID, two passed away from it. Um, and just about all of them had blistering headache as one of the uh, initial symptoms, suggesting to me that it, it was really uh, like a, a viral meningitis and that they had early uh, neuroinvasive properties. So long-winded way to answer the vitamin D story, but huge believers, uh, and clearly um, there, there's something to that story. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess this is a statement from Dr. Kuru uh, talking about some of the first case series published in the New England Journal showing hypoxic ischemic changes, but no encephalitis, meningitis, strokes, or changes in olfactory bulbs in the tracks of 18 consecutive patients who died up to 32 days after the onset of symptoms with SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think pointing to the fact that we really do need to continue with the pathologic evaluations um, and that investigation. Yeah, I think, I think uh, as I said, there was a, a MRI study that clearly showed there's involvement of the olfactory bulb. Mm -hmm. I, I think and Dr. Harris will can really speak to this. Uh, when you look at, at the brain, it's, there's an enormous amount of tissue, you know, and all you're doing is looking at little pieces here and there um, and, you know, whether you're doing it in a systematic fashion or not is another question. And so, uh, you know, I will defer to Dr. Harris, but this is an art and, it, you know, you really have to be very careful in looking for this. Plus, you know, there could be microscopic changes in the brainstem that are not obvious to just, uh, you know, just a uh, light powered microscopy might require uh, EM or, or immunostaining and things like that. So I would be, you know, really cautious. I, I mean, I would, I mean, the original studies coming out of China really didn't describe um, very much the, the prothrombotic uh, nature of this disease. It really didn't describe the pediatric uh, manifestations. And so I think we really have to be very careful. Even West Nile virus, when that first came out, West Nile subsequently, you know, is you know, recognized to cause not only Guillain-Barre, but can cause uh, um, uh, even uh, myelitis. And we missed that for almost a year. And so I, I think there is, I, I look at those with great, uh, great trepidation. I think there's a larger series and a larger experience we need to look at. And it's the old, the old expression, you know, you cannot prove a negative. And so to say something doesn't exist, I, I think is very, very difficult unless you have huge sample sizes. Uh, one question for Dr. Denny. For young patients who've had COVID, do you recommend that they um, take something like aspirin as a preventive measure? That's a good question uh, that doesn't have a clear answer right now. Um, there are some, um, you know, some neuropathology studies suggesting that there's a lot of white clot um, uh, and patients who have died, um, you know, most of the patients who have died also have, um, you know, other vascular risk factors, but um, there's some neuropathology work that's being done um, in New York. Um, it's, I don't know if it's even published yet, but showing a lot of white clots, so fibrin clot, which would be a reason to give aspirin. The short story is no. Um, we haven't broadly recommended that um, every patient who has COVID takes aspirin. Um, we love aspirin, uh, but I think there's also some potential, you know, side effects. So um, for patients who don't have any um, clotting problems, stroke or otherwise, um, I wouldn't recommend it this time. I think we just don't know enough. Um, and there is a push now through the, um, the AHA um, to start, you know, documenting um, all of our COVID cases in this nationwide database called Get With The Guidelines. So we'll hopefully have some outcome-based data related to that. And then um, NINDS just funded um, an external grant to look 
Um, it's an outcomes-based um, data for um, COVID patients. So I think we'll know more soon, but for now, um, only the antithrombotic signal with thrombotic complications.